joy to the world. Joy to the world. New 
and glorious morn fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine. When Christ was born, oh, night, oh, holy night, oh, night divine, truly he taught us to love one another. His love and His gospel is peace. Chains shall He break, for the slave is our brother, and in His name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy. In grateful chorus praise we let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. Father, we proclaim your glory this afternoon, this evening, as we remember the God who sent his son as a baby to earth. I thank you so much that even though we are a weary world, the weary world can rejoice in who you are and what you've done. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. And I'd like to invite the Morris family up for the lighting of the Advent candle. On the evening of the Christmas celebration, Jesus' birthday, we light all the candles of the Advent wreath. First, we light the candle of hope because Jesus is our hope. Second, we light the candle of peace because Jesus is our hope and peace. Third, we light the candle for joy, because Jesus brings joy. Fourth, we light the candle for love, because Jesus is love. Finally, we light the center candle. This is the Christ candle. Jesus is born, Jesus has come, Jesus is our salvation. Here's a reading from Galatians. But when the time has fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, Galatians 4.4. Let us pray. Great God of love and light, we thank you now for the light that the special star over 2,000 years ago that guided humble shepherds and learned wise men to the holy babe. Lead us now by the light of your love that we may also follow you to new life in him. In celebration of the of birthday of your King and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So much more. Okay, where is it safe? Amy?
It's Michael Bachman. <laughs> Michael Bachman, I'm the lead pastor. I want to welcome you all here this afternoon. Uh, we do something every year kind of special with the kids. And I want to invite the kids to come up right now, kind of spread out over this space here. So all the kids come up, or the, I don't know, the young at heart, come on up. Kids, you can spread out kind of along the side there, too. Let's make a big U. Well, kids, are you excited about Christmas? So what are you most excited about with Christmas? Food? Food's a good thing. Anyone else? What are you most excited about with Christmas tomorrow? You like the presents, but you're excited about the birth of baby Jesus. Yeah. Good answer. Anyone else? What are you excited about? William? Got to, got to see the birth of Jesus? Cool. Well, one of there's a lot of things I love about Christmas. One thing that I like is candy canes. Who here likes candy canes? Me. Well, you're all going to get one in a moment. Does anyone know where these candy canes came from? You think it came from somewhere in Europe? You know, actually, uh, there's a legend, a story. We're not entirely sure if it's true, but it's kind of a cool story about the invention of candy canes. And I want to share that with you right now. So there was a couple hundred years ago in England, there was a time that was illegal to celebrate Christmas. That's the law. Like, if you celebrate Christmas, you could end up in jail. What do you guys think about that? That would be terrible. So if, if it was against the law to celebrate Christmas, would you still... You, no, whoa, 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 okay. We'll have a talk later, son. We'll have a talk later. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that would really stink if we couldn't celebrate Christmas. Well, there was a candy maker who he really loved Jesus. And he wanted to find some way that since they couldn't celebrate Christmas, some way he could still tell people about Jesus. So he started making a piece of candy called candy canes that he sold around Christmas and people could hang on their trees. But what he made, did with it, he wanted to use these as a way to help people remember what Jesus did. Like, for example, what colors are on the candy cane? Red and white. Red and white. And for the red, for what shape is it? Blood. It's in the shape of blood? It's in twirl. What? what, what? I should have you do the children's message, Kay. <laughs> you know, it's in straight lines and stripes. Because he wanted people to remember that when Jesus died for us, he was whipped. There were stripes on his back. And that his blood was shed for us. And does anyone know, what does the Bible say his blood did to us when we put our trust in Jesus? Anyone know? It forgave our sins. The Bible says because of Jesus' blood, we are washed clean. That we are as white as snow. Is snow pretty white? Yep. You bet it is. So he wanted them to remember, whenever they looked at those colors, how Jesus' blood forgave our sins. Mm -hmm. Here's another thing. Well, what shape is uh, a candy cane in? A flat, like a staff or a stepping. I said, I should have you do this instead of me, Kay. Uh, yeah, it's in the same shape as like, the shepherd. You know, they got that staff they use it to hook the sheep. Well, the Bible says that Jesus is our good shepherd. Don't talk for a moment. Uh, do you know what it means for Jesus to be our good shepherd? Anyone know? Ella, do you have an answer? Oh, okay. What does it mean for Jesus to be our good shepherd? No, you, you've answered enough, my son. You're, you're good. Think about this. Like a shepherd, he cares for the sheep. He loves the sheep. He makes sure they're safe. He guides them to good food and water. And the same way, okay, I know. Uh, in the same way, Jesus, he's our good shepherd. And he loves every one of you so much and cares for you. So whenever you eat a candy cane, I want you to remember. So right now, who wants a candy cane? I get to pick the purple. Okay, okay. 
Go ahead. Everyone can get a candy cane, but don't go yet. I want to pray over you all. Okay, let me pray for you all. Dear Jesus, I am so thankful for every kid here. And for every kid here, you love them so much. It is your pleasure to call them yours. And Father, I pray to remember that you died for them. And remember that you're their good shepherd who loves and watches out for them. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, kids, thanks for coming right, up. Now, now boys, listen to Miss oh, Amy. Boys and girls, now, it, um, what I wanted to say is if you have played bells at church um, before, we're going to have you guys play the first Noel again. Now, if you haven't played bells, uh, if you're in kindergarten on up, you could probably do this. So if you want to try it out, okay? I'm going to have you guys line up, and I'll come pass out bells to you, okay? So go where you're supposed to stand. Graceland, you know where you're supposed to go. All right, so boys and girls, most of you have played these before. If you haven't, do you remember when I point to your row up here that has your color in it, what do you do? You play your bell, okay? So, so moms and dads, some of us have practiced this, some of it haven't, but I think we're going to do a pretty good job. I hope this blesses you this Christmas Eve. Everybody can see, right? You want to scoot in, Annalise?
You know, I love having the kids up here, just from the aspect that we get to worship together as a family. And let's give them a hand again. Oh, there it is again. Let's see. Grab my Bible over here. Well, we get to spend just kind of a few minutes doing a bit of a Christmas Eve meditation. And, uh, you know, 2020 has been a, it's been a challenging year for many of us. It's been a challenging year, really, for the world. And going through history, there's been a number of challenging years. Uh, one very challenging year that the world faced was the year of 1914. And due to that year, you had the assassination of the uh, Australi Austrian Archduke, and that launched World War I. Uh, very soon, you had an entire generation of men in Europe uh, killing each other in war. Uh, by December of that year, uh, the armies were settled in the trenches. Uh, the trenches were so close that one side could yell to the other side and have a conversation back and forth. And maybe you've heard what happened that Christmas of 1914. Uh, you had a couple of the German troops that decided that even though they were at war, they were away from home, they were in the trenches, that they were going to celebrate Christmas. So they uh, set up some trees in the trenches, lit some candles, and started to sing Christmas carols. Well, the, the British on the other side heard the singing, and they're not going to be outdone by a bunch of Germans. So they start singing Christmas carols also. Uh, soon Christmas greetings are being yelled back and forth. The artillery guns went silent. And men started making their way out of the trenches, and they went out in the no man's land, the land in between, and started interacting. Uh, they traded presents. Uh, in fact, uh, a couple groups uh, started organizing some singing together, singing Christmas carols. Uh, I'll show you some pictures here on the screen. Uh, another thing that happened in a few places, they started playing football games. I have no idea what side won, but it was just this incredible moment that they're at war. But at least for a day, the war stopped. There was a sense of peace. And for many people, when they saw that happen, they thought, oh, this is a, a glimmer of hope. You know, maybe peace is possible. Maybe if we just interact more and talk more and work hard enough, we can get along and peace will be there. It gave them a taste of what could be. And as much as that gave some people hope, well, it almost felt like a mockery of peace because the next day, the war continued. The artillery, artillery guns started shooting again. Men started shooting each other. Over the next four years, over 20 million people would be dead as a result of that war. And would lay the seeds to the rise of Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, which would kill millions more. You know, people came out kind of asking, you know, peace, that there was hope, there was a taste of it. What went wrong? And you kind of see that story repeating itself uh, again and again. This idea that, you know, if we just work really hard, if we love a little bit more, then we can get there. Albert Einstein really kind of reflected the sentiment when he said that, you know, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. Uh, you have the starting of the United Nations. Uh, and War has still happened. We've had the peace movement of the 60s. And again and again, as much as we desire peace, it always seems just out of reach. Wondering if you can ever reach that point. And, and I'm talking about peace on, on a political aspect. Think about individual peace. Because many of us feel an inner turmoil. Maybe you're here and you think about the future. And there's a lot in the future that's scary and great anxiety. And you just... Wish there was some release from that tension. Maybe you're haunted by the past. Maybe there's mistakes that you've made in your life that you look in the mirror, you see those mistakes, and you think, okay, maybe I seem to do enough good things and some way I need to find redemption in my life. If I work hard enough, if I pour into my family, maybe I can overcome those past mistakes. And no matter how far, how hard you try, those mistakes always seem to be there. Once again, peace just seems just a little bit out of reach. You know, the Bible says there's a good reason for this. Uh, Romans 3.23, uh, Paul was writing, and he said, all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. 
That every one of us have this sin issue, a, a self-centeredness inside that holds us back. Paul himself uh, wrote about his lament. This is the Apostle Paul, the great man of God who wrote a big part of the New Testament. Uh, he had sin issues in his life. He kept on doing bad things. Uh, he wrote in Romans how, I, I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I keep on doing. He wrote this, what a wretched man I am. Who can rescue me from this body that is subject to death? I don't know if any of you have ever asked that question. What hope is there? What can save me? What can bring me that sense of peace? And I have to wonder throughout history when again and again we think we just try harder, more understand we can get there. Could it be that again and again we are treating the problem of a lack of peace with the wrong kind of medicine? What is the answer? Over the last month, we've been doing this series. And uh, kind of the idea behind the series, you think about the Christmas story. Think about the shepherds. You know, the shepherds, the, the angels show up, say, hey, go and see this baby, this Messiah, the Savior has been born to you. They rush to the manger. And as they're looking down at baby Jesus, who do they think the child would be? And they're armed with a series of prophecies that hundreds of years before, God has spoke through prophets telling who this Messiah would grow up to be. And one of the most famous ones is found in Isaiah chapter 9, where it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And we've been going through each of these four names. Like, say, the Wonderful Counselor brings back the idea of a royal advisor, someone who's there to help the king find success, to give him that guidance. That if you're here, and as you're seeking life to the fullest and struggling to get there, if you want someone to give you that counsel, well, our Messiah, he's the wonderful counselor. His counsel isn't just anything. It's shockingly good. If you're in that position, seek the wonderful counsel. Or the mighty God, mighty God's idea of a, a divine warrior, a, a warrior who would fight on behalf of his people. That if you're here in you feel the sense of injustice in the world and just feel so helpless to fight against it. Well, again, we have a Messiah. Jesus came to fight on our behalf. Last week was Everlasting Father. And Father has an element of security to it, an element of counsel to it, but it's more relational. That, that a father doesn't just do this because he's supposed to do it, because he's paid to do it. A father does it because he loves his children. He has a vested interest in them succeeding. And remember, God's love for us, as even with the kids, with the good shepherd, Jesus has that love for every single one of us. And then you have the Prince of Peace. That's what we're going to think about for a, a few minutes here, the Prince of Peace. The last couple weeks I've been teaching you a little bit of Hebrew, and I'm going to teach you some today. The reason why is... When they translate Hebrew to English, sometimes it's a really easy translation. Sometimes a little bit gets lost in the translation. The Hebrew can have a much richer meaning behind it. And when we think about the word peace, what do you think about? Maybe the absence of conflicts. Maybe if you're a parent with a house feels like after the kids go to bed. I would love to experience that, but we have two cats that are, are really good at disrupting peace. Uh, if you go back to the Hebrew words for Prince of Peace, there's two words, and we're gonna start with peace. The first word is this. It's the word shalom. You may have heard this word before. It means far more than just an absence of conflict. And it's kind of a, a hard word to define. Uh, a few definitions from writers. Um, uh, one definition from Tim Keller. Uh, Tim Keller said it this way, that shalom experience is multidimensional, complete well-being, Physical, psychological, social, and spiritual. It flows from all of one's relationships being put right with God, with oneself, and with others. It, it means what's it like to be completely reconciled with God. Vernon Grounds writes that where shalom is present, sin and sorrow are absent. Where the sword is at rest, where reconciliation has been completely affected, where righteousness prevails, and where people rejoice together, there, shalom reigns. Uh, Cornel Cornelius Plantiga writes that it's just the way that the world should be. 
And trying to lump that all together, I just put it this way, that it's a sense of completeness. You know, the world as it should be. Like, let me give you some examples. Just think about maybe a time that you're with your family and everyone's getting along and you're around the table enjoying some really good food and the room is full of laughter and you're just loving being together. That's a taste of shalom. Or maybe you're out fishing on the boat or in the middle of the lake, everything is still. You just hear the sound of some birds chirping, maybe a loon going off somewhere. You look up, you see an eagle flying through the air, and you just think, wow, God, I'm surrounded by your creation. This is beautiful. This is so good. It's a sense of shalom. Maybe you think about a community, a farming community that just had a fantastic harvest, and there's prosperity everywhere, and they're celebrating together. It's a taste of shalom. Or what about that, that child that just had a bad dream? And he yells out, and maybe his dad comes running into the room, and that child climbs into his dad's lap. And there's that sense of security that, okay, my dad's here. Everything is good. It's a taste of shalom. When Isaiah gives this prophecy to the people of Judah, uh, throughout the nation, it's this sense of shalom that they wanted it. That there are people who are desperate for shalom in their lives for that sense of completeness and wholeness. And throughout their history, there have been times again and again that they're able to, to taste it. Like that's kind of what it looks like, but it always seems just out of reach. And here's Isaiah saying, saying, God is sending someone. Someone who is going to bring about that kind of shalom that you desire. During the time of Jesus, you think about it. When he's born, uh, the world seems so out of kilter. The Romans are impressing it's saying there's someone coming who will bring about that peace. Shalom. Here's the other word. The, the word we have for prince is the word sars. Now, uh, Bible translators, they often translate it as prince. Um, it, it, it means far more than that. I think actually one of the best ways to translate that is, is what you would use for a, uh, a commander, uh, a general or a commander. You know, when you think of prince, you think of someone who's next in line to be king. SARS is someone who, yeah, there's some royal connotations sometimes there, but they're in a place of authority. That they have the ability to say, this happens and it happens. That they have the ability to make things happen. Like in our country, the closest you can get to SARS might be the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And to say that, that Jesus, that when this Messiah comes, not only will be about Shalom, but he's going to have the authority to actually do it. You look at the next verse, it says that of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That first line of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. I used to read that and think, oh, just saying that, you know, the kingdom of God will never end. But actually he says of his government, but also his Peace, the greatness of his peace. But we know, and meaning that the peace, the shalom, will just get greater and greater and greater. What you think is shalom, what you taste shalom, is nothing, nothing compared to what this Messiah will bring. You know, I think about our world. You know, we live in a world that's looking for shalom. I mean, wouldn't you love to have more shalom in your life? And again, we have this idea, if we just work hard enough, we can get there. But history shows again and again that every time we think maybe we're on the road to Shalom, it's just still a little bit out of reach. When we think we get there, even unexpected things happen. Whether it's a, a genocide or Rwanda or you know, the Twin Towers being attacked or a, a police shooting in Minneapolis. Again and again, we think we're maybe tasting a sense of Shalom. It seems to fall apart again and again. And earlier I had made the comment that I wonder if we're trying to treat the same disease over and over again with the wrong kind of medicine. The wrong kind of medicine of saying that, you know, if we just do work hard enough. Remember that passage I mentioned earlier from Paul. As he talked about the lack of peace in his life and his struggle with sin, you know, he asked the question, who will rescue me from the body that is subject to death? And here's what I love about Paul. Paul actually 
has an answer. You know, throughout history, there's been a, a number of people who thought that they could be the, you know, commander of Shalom. Uh, during Paul's lifetime, you had Caesar, the emperor of Rome, uh, even going back to the birth of Jesus, Caesar Augustus, he told people that he was that commander of peace. He said he brought, came to bring peace to the world, and he had quite a way of doing that. His way of doing that was going to a town and saying, okay, my army's here, either you submit to my peace or we're going to kill you all. Uh, he thought that was a way to bring about peace, when really it was quite a mockery of peace. During World War I, um, there's one story about uh, Henry Ford, the car guy. Uh, Henry Ford was passionate about peace, and he wanted to end World War I, so he led a group of about 70 people on something called the Peace Boats. Uh, they went to Europe, and they were going to march in, and he thought he was going to organize peace. And it ended up, you know, he ended up being a laughing stock. Many people who tried to take on the mantle of the commander of Shalom but going back to Paul, asking who will really do it. See, Paul had an answer because the very one that Isaiah had prophesied about, Paul had experienced him. Paul had met him. Paul had, had seen the transformation that this person had done in his own life. And what does Paul say for an answer? He says this, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Could it be that the answer that the world continues to ignore is Jesus, the commander of Shalom. That Jesus, the baby born 2,000 years ago, was actually God in the flesh. That when it comes to our show of inner peace, that he's the one that deals with that. For anyone here who is haunted by the past, well, all those past mistakes he dealt with when he died on the cross, so that anyone who puts their trust in him that says yes to Jesus is forgiven and given a new identity. So that when they look in the mirror and think of all the wrong things they've done, you have the voice of God saying, no, no, before me you stand blameless. You are my beloved child who is welcome into my presence. You know, for those who have anxiety about the future, you have the promise from Jesus that he showed his power. He already conquered death. He rose from the dead. And his promise that he's going to come back someday as king. When he does that, everything's to be taken care of. So we can live with that peace of knowing how the story ends. You know, when you think about division around the world and the chaos that's out there, you know, I, I have to confess that the people of Jesus have not done always a good job of keeping his commands. And there's a lot of horrible things that have been done in the name of Jesus that has nothing to do with what he said. But when people seriously follow Jesus and are empowered by his spirit, there are incredible things that happen. Like in the early church, you had a group of people that said they were filled with the supernatural love with God. It was said in their gatherings, there was no Gentile or Jew. There was no male or, nor female, no slave nor free, but all were one in Jesus. That for those communities who were committed to Christ, filled with his power, the divisions just fell away. They were rejected. You know, we live in a world that needs shalom. And maybe the starting point again is not to work harder, not to try more to understand, but maybe the answer is to truly begin with Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who on Christmas Day became God in the flesh, who has given his spirit to his followers so that he might become God in us. I'm going to do something special right now. I'm going to ask right now if we could turn off these lights. If Kay could get that. Yep. You know, uh, the reason we have the room dark is the dark represents something. The darkness represents the world that we live in that is in need of shalom. A world that is full of chaos. A world that is full of division and violence. And it's into this world that you have Jesus comes in. This candle right here, it represents the Prince of Peace who enters into this dark world bringing his shalom. And all of you, I hope you received the candle your way in. If you didn't, you can run back and grab one by the door. 
But I'm going to ask Kay to come up here right now. Okay, you already got that light. What I'm going to do is uh, we're going to begin to make our way down the row uh, lighting candles. If you get your candle lit, pass it to the person next. I'm going to ask Titus to help me. Titus, if you could start uh, going down both these roads. I'm going to see. Brad, can I draft you? We're going to begin singing Silent Night. In a moment. So as you spread this around the room, you know, the, one of the beautiful things that Jesus does to those who have said yes to him, he fills them with his spirit, we're invited to join him and bring shalom to the world. But as Jesus spreads, so does the sense of shalom. In a moment, we're going to sing Silent Night together, and I want to invite you to do a few things during that song. First of all, as we sing that song, have a chance to enjoy it and, and to worship but maybe you're here this morning and you've never had a relationship with Jesus. You've never encountered the Prince of Peace, the Commander of Shalom. And if you've never done that, begin simply by saying yes to him. And saying, Jesus, I, I believe that's who you are. I, I believe that you made a way for me to be reconciled to you by your death on the cross. You bring forgiveness through that. And, and I accept your work in my life. I simply say yes to him. And if you've never done that before, well, now's a good time to do that. Or maybe you've said that prayer, but man, you're still trying to earn God's approval. You're, you're still fighting, still struggling to find redemption, to find peace in your life. And maybe as we sing, it's time to surrender that and say, okay, God, I know I can't do it on my own. So I invite you to be that peace, that shalom that I so desperately need. Let's all stand together. Let's sing Silent Night. And then we'll close in prayer. going to invite us to sing a cappella, the first verse.
so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. You know, you look, don't blow them out yet. And you look around the room and see what a difference from one little light what a difference it makes as it makes its way around the room. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you so much that, Lord, we didn't deserve you at all, but you came into our world. We didn't have to go to you. You came to us so we may experience shalom that's only found in you. And Father, for us in this room, I pray we would experience your shalom this Christmas, regardless of our life situation, when we find you to be our peace, to be the only one who can truly bring that about. Uh, Father, we confess all the kind of t ways we've tried to reach out on our own, knowing that only you can truly fulfill. Father, may we live with that and experience it as we go from here. In the name of Jesus, amen. Merry Christmas to you all, and you can feel free to drop these off. We've got a box there in the back. I hope you have a great evening and a great day tomorrow. Thank you.